It is my privilege and joy that we can continue our Bible study about the epistle to the Ephesians. And we have today the subtitle, God's Grand Christ-Centered Plan. We read from verse 3 from the first chapter on, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, we have seen in our last presentation that Paul is the author of this, and after he introduced himself as an author sent by God, he starts his introduction by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So here we have that God put all the blessings that we as humans can have he placed in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So we are chosen before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Well, God knew very well. If man would fall into sin, he would not be holy anymore. And he would not be without blame. And so he has chosen us before the foundation of the world. In this plan, he made it possible that we, fallen being, can become again holy and blameless in him, in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So we are predestined to be his children. In Christ, he already said us who we are to be according to the good pleasure of his will. It was not a plan made by man. No, it was him who made it and brought it into accomplishment through Christ. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. God cannot accept something that is not blameless that is not holy, but in the beloved we are accepted because we are one with him, in whom we have redemption through his blood. So in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, in whom we have redemption. So it's only in him that there is redemption, in his blood, in his life. And we have to study that deeper during this time. Wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now you see, what could we do without wisdom? In grace, through Christ, God made accessible to us wisdom and prudence. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. The mystery of his will. We could not be seen before according to his good pleasure which he had purposed in himself. So you see, there are two things that are working here together. Christ and the Father. And the plan is through and through made by the will of God, not by the will of man. Is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Sinful nature brought separation from God. And so, now, in Christ, heaven and earth, God and man are united again. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things of the counsel of his own will. So we are predestinated, what? To be like his son, to be like him. And yes, we will go to understand even better this plan and what is meant by predestination. Because some people got confused about those things, not understanding the whole picture of the plan of salvation. That we should be to the praise of his glory, 
who first trusted in Christ, in whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that he believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and to the praise of his glory. So everything is in Christ and to the Holy Spirit. We have that redemption. We have that assurance of that what he has accomplished. Now, let's say it in my words. It is God who invented the redemption of man and realized it in Christ. That seems like a very simple idea, but it's very, very profound. Because Paul repeats it several times in his introduction to the Ephesians. It's God's invention. Some people want to be accepted by God. They want to do something that he should accept them. But did we invent Redemption? Did we even have the desire to be saved? The majority of this earth people, the, the people of this earth, do not even know that they are lost. Do not even know that there is a redemption. Because they're ignorant through their, their, their deception. They're totally ignorant. So, and the Christian ones, they they want to be accepted by God. And they say, I don't want to lose my redemption. I don't want to, I want to. And they worry. And it's all about them. Not knowing. God was it who made the plan. God realized it in Christ. I have just to in, introduce it. To be, it should become mine. But it is his. Redemption. He made it for each one of us. This plan existed before the earth and human beings were created. The goal is the restoration of man to a perfect being, being able to love with God's love, to fulfill his purpose. Yes, separation is becoming imperfect. And now he makes us perfect in Christ so that we are able again to love with God's love and fulfill our purpose for what we were created. In order to achieve this goal, God begat Christ as man into our life. Into the life of Adam, he came. So we got the sonship through that, that he begat his son in the life of Adam and then made a new creature out of that, as we will see later. And this leads to the liberation from the condition in which we all are born. It brings to us also forgiveness. But it's sonship that will bring to us that forgiveness. Grace makes us wise and prudent. That means it leads to knowledge of self and God. Yes, the knowledge of ourself and the knowledge of God will not save us. But without this knowledge, we cannot be saved. Knowledge is something we need to put into practice. So, knowledge comes first. And then, faith into that, in that information that then leads to salvation. So, without godly wisdom that he came to bring to us in Christ, we cannot see ourselves and we never can understand God. Why is faith the only way to bring the accomplished salvation into one's own life? Even this is so important. You have seen in uh, verse 13 or before he says, you trusted and ye believed. So there are two acts that Paul knew exactly how we function in order to explain those things. The Holy Spirit in one's life is the proof of sonship to God, the pledge, the sealing of our inheritance. So without him, without my spirit being connected to 
the Holy Spirit. I'm not his son. And then whatever work I might do out of my sinful nature, it might look good. It is not approved by God. Because the only thing that is approved by God is to be his child. So we have to see the history, the previous things that happened in Ephesus so that we understand the letter that was written by Paul. So we saw last time that three years Paul taught the people in Ephesus. So he brought to them the message. He preached three months in the synagogue and then two years daily in the school of one named Tyrannus. And then he had to leave because of revolt and had to go to another place. So he taught them three years. And in his letter, Paul refers back to what he had taught them. So previous to the letter to the Ephesians, Paul educated the Ephesians. And now in the letter, he refers back to that teaching. But he doesn't go through the whole teaching again. But he takes out the essence that he considers they should remember. You see, when I have a patient before me, as I know the human structure and how we function, that gives me a background on how to approach him. Because I need to know where I have to go exactly, where I have to enter his details. But if I would have not had that back uh, information, I would be lost. And this is the same with us. If we don't have the prior knowledge that Paul taught to the people, we cannot understand his letter. We must have a prior knowledge of a big plan. So then the things described in the letter of Ephesians become very alive for us. Because we know in the big frame of the picture where to put the detail. So Paul enters details because he has elaborated for three years on the big picture. And of course, also the details. But now he just remembers them on, on big points. And we will look to those points. But in order to look to those points, we must have that framework, that big picture to understand his letter. If not, we might misinterpret it. And we will take the words like uh, great people, we could say, people who instituted uh, certain beliefs or denominations, just took that word of predestination from here and made a whole theory of it without understanding the big picture. If we understand the big picture, if we know that which is unchangeable, we will put that, what is written here, in the right place. And it will make, will make to our mind sense. It, it, will, it will give us power and it will be reasonable. But if we don't have that prior knowledge to know, okay, when he says predestination, I know what he means. I know what he means. But if I don't know that picture, then I say, oh, predestination, what does it mean? And then you go to the uh, uh, books to see the definitions of predestination, and then you get a lot of ideas, and you're confused. You don't know nothing. And you might choose one of those uh, offered things and say, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But how do you know it's right? How do you know that you don't go after the other people that believed in a wrong theory of predestination? So we have to know what Paul knew. And he knew the problem of man and the human being very well. But we don't know that. And that's our, that's our difficulty. Because we don't know ourselves. That's why we are so confused. Paul knew 
man. He knew the human being. And he knew where the problem of the human being sits. That's why he could go so directly and pinpoint things. But if we miss his pre-knowledge, then we will miss it all. And we, don't, we want to avoid that. So let's give some answers to some questions in this study that we will do this quarter. So what is the point of a plan of salvation? What is the point? Why do we need it? Where lies the being lost? So what does it mean to be lost? Is it a state or an act? And here there is great, great confusion in a way that most people I spoke to in these last 20 years, and I have met from many denominations from different kinds of faith, they have one thing in common. They believed being lost is to do the wrong. That's their beliefs. And that's, of course, if, if to being lost is to do the wrong act, then you just need to do the right act. And then you're safe. It's amazing. Jesus says this very clear in Matthew 7, 22 and 23. He says, many will say, so many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonders for works? Did he do something wrong? These are actions. These are people who, who do things. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now what is he referring to? These people obviously did the right things. They worked hard. Why is he not accepting them? Because he said, I don't know you. Are you a state or an act? Is salvation, sonship, a state or an act? We have to know what is first and what is second. We have to know what is cause and what is effect. It's amazing how blind people are. We believe salvation is doing the right thing. Now, if doing the right thing is salvation, then there are many people who do the right things. And Jesus says, no, it's not the right things you do. It is the state from which you do those things. You do it as a son, you're accepted because you're a son. Because I know you, you're mine. And to be a son of God or a child of God is a state, not an act. So, religious people, they are like, I would say, physicians or the medical system. They don't want to change the state. They don't want you to become healthy. Just keep the disease stable. No, you don't. You cannot change that you have hypertension or diabetes. You just need to do some actions to keep the balance. But you cannot change the state. But if we don't change the state, we just act from outside. And that is a terrible mistake. So, where lies the being lost? We will see it a little bit later in what it lies according to what Jesus says. And then we may need to know what is this condition? What is this state in which we are? What is it? Because then we don't understand why sonship. Where does this being lost come from? Where does it come from? Is it an issue from inside or outside of the human being? 
where does to be lost come from? How did man get into this state? One of the very important questions to answer. Because we will see it's a state, it's not an action that makes man lost. And then what is the difficulty of this condition? Why does it need such a high plan of salvation that is full of wisdom and understanding? Why is it that it demands so much in order to be accomplished? And then why is Christ the only solution? Cannot Confucius or Buddha or anyone else can be? You see, I had a patient just these days and she is a Christian and her child not and she uh, says, take Jesus, take Jesus. I said, I don't even want to hear. I said, I understand her. Because if she doesn't know her difficulty, if she doesn't know what needs to be changed, if she doesn't know what is her issue, how will you ever know that Christ is the only solution? Why is there not in another name a possibility? Why does Paul in this first 14 uh, texts of Ephesians puts all the emphasis that everything is accomplished in one, in Christ? Why do we have no other option? You see, we cannot just come and say Christ is the only solution. And some people believe that, but they don't know their condition. So even this belief that Christ is the only solution doesn't help them at all because they don't know where to apply it. So we must, have, we must give clear answers to these questions. So let's go to the beginning. What is it to be lost? Luke 4, 18 says to be poor, brokenhearted captive, blind, and bruised. And Revelation 3.17 says, to be wretched, miserable, blind, poor, and naked. And as you obviously can see it, this is a condition, not an act. To be poor means not to act, not an act. Of course, from poorness you have, you're handicapped to act certain things. But it's the condition that needs to be changed. From a poor, you need to become rich. From a broken-hearted or naked, to be closed. From a captive or wretch, you need to be free. And from a blind, you need to see. And from unmiserable and bruised, you need to be again healthy. That's a condition. Jesus doesn't speak about act. He doesn't say to the people in, in Nazareth, in his hometown, Oh, people, let's do more works. Let's do more wishing. Let's go to accomplish something. Or he might have got some volunteers. No, he says, your condition is a lost one. And I came to change your condition. I came to, came to make a difference in your condition, not in your action. Because this state in which you are born means self-deception. And self-deception means it can do wonderful outside acts that might look like they come from a loving heart. But we have not understood how deep, how, yes, they are separate, they are contradicting each other, selfishness and, and love, but how much selfishness has copied love. And we don't see that the good acts we do, we do out of selfishness because we have an unchanged condition, not an unchanged behavior. Religion and medicine are in the same wrong path. They do not change conditions. They change actions. They require actions to be saved. Isn't it amazing how blind we are? So Jesus comes and says, Matthew 15, 20 to 18, 10 to 20, he speaks about washed hand or not washed hand, and then 
He says to the Pharisees or to his disciples about the Pharisees, they be blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. And what does he refer? And he says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. And in the text before it says that what goes into the mouth does not defile the man. It doesn't make him unclean. It doesn't make him sinful. But that what comes out from the heart, that is that what makes him unclean. So he makes very clear that the condition that man has is inside of him. Though blind Pharisee, in Matthew 23, 26, and 27, Cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So Jesus points it very clear. Cleanse first that which is within the cup. O oh, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto withered sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of that man's bones and of all uncleanness. So these are the people that will be many coming that day to Christ and say, look to our actions. They appear beautiful outward. They're nice actions. It looks like they have given the all they had. They sacrificed. He will not accept it. Because it's not the action that Christ searches. He searches to see the state. What is within? What is that inner state to be? And if that is wrong, and this is the deception of the deception, to do the wrong out of the wrong state. And that's the deception of deception. This is why Jesus emphasized it's so hard. And even Paul and the writers, be not deceived. Your good actions do not prove that you're right. The wrong prove that you're wrong. That's sure. But the right actions don't prove that you're right. They don't prove that your heart is a new heart. They don't prove it. So God needs to help us. That's the difficulty of salvation. So how did this contamination come about? How, how did we become unclean inside? So how did this black thing came into this glass? Did it come from outside in or from inside out? How did this happen? Now, we don't need to study this. The picture shows clearly that that thing must come from outside the glass. I cannot come from inside. But have we to deal here with a physical or a spiritual element? Is the state of being lost a spiritual state or a physical state? And that's why we need to know the difference between the physical and the spiritual element. A physical element can be contaminated or unclean only from the outside. That which is physical can be made unclean from what comes to it. I can have unclean hands. Those unclean hands come not within the hands, I mean from within the hands, but from outside of the hands. But it's not so in the spiritual element. A spiritual element can be contaminated only from the inside out. So here we have to have this Understanding and making the difference. Understanding the human being, is he just matter or does he have a spirit? Because if he's just matter, then his uncleanness is in matter. Then matter just needs to be washed from outside. Then the plan of salvation is, has no difficulties. If our problem would be in our brain, then God just would, would transplant our brain and everything would be fine. But that is not so. 
The difficulty lies because it's inside of the Spirit. And it could not come from outside because the Spirit can only defile Himself from inside. And understanding very well the way we were created and the way we were made, we will be clear. Because what I would like to avoid, and I think you too, to not come and be that day, which will come very, very fast. To be among those many that come and Jesus says, sorry, you're not my children. I don't know you. I know your actions. They are actions that are without the law. Because you haven't done them out of me. You did them out of yourself to gain salvation. You did it because you thought you can recommend yourself by actions. No. I'm sorry. So, we don't want to be among those. We want to be among those few. That he will say, oh, I know you. You're my, child, my child. You're my daughter. You're my son. Come, enter the joy of the Father. So may God help us to put the foundation in this study that whatever struggles may come, whatever temptations may come, we may just stay fast, unmoved, to be among those who overcome. Amen.